Did you know that before being sent to Mars, the Moon, or anywhere else, landing spacecraft undergo meticulous cleansing to destroy even the slightest traces of life? It's true. Not those who arrived from there, but those sent there are the ones we clean. This might seem strange and counterintuitive, right? After all, nothing threatens us. But we are not talking about an external threat because the threat comes from ourselves. It's simple. Scientists are trying to protect other planets, satellites, and asteroids from us. Not from humanity, but from earthly life in general. We don't want to infect, for example, Mars with terrestrial viruses, bacteria, or anything larger. After all, if we bring terrestrial microorganisms there, they can establish colonies. You might wonder, what's wrong? But how then would we distinguish between authentic Martian life and a mutated, earthborn, quote unquote, infection? So scientists actually have a point. But it's not only space missions that need such a careful approach. There are places on Earth that scientists try to protect just as vigilantly. These are places with closed ecosystems, isolated from the external environment for thousands of years. People often compare such places with other planets. And although this comparison has become somewhat of a cliché, just think about it for a minute. Do we have any other reference points for what life would look like on other planets with a different atmosphere and chemical composition of the environment? These are our only reference points based on something tangible rather than hypothetical. Occasionally, our planet gives us a glimpse into unknown worlds when we can access locations that have been completely isolated for thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of years. And when scientists manage to find such a place, there are simply no words to describe what they feel. These unique places often reveal incredible secrets about humanity, and some things found there can totally change our understanding of who we are. What are these places? They are caves. Join us on our exploration of caves, harboring the most fascinating finds that amazed scientists. Weird Things Found in Caves Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. This will help the YouTube algorithm to understand what topics you like, ensuring that such educational content will pop up more often in your recommended videos. 1986, the historical region of Dobruja, near the city of Constanta in Romania. The authorities planned to construct a geothermal power plant in the area. For this purpose, scientists conduct preliminary geological research. As geologists dug deeper and deeper, they suddenly discovered a void. Do you think they were thrilled to death to see something unique discovered right before their eyes? Actually, they weren't surprised even one bit. This region is known for its abundance of underground caves, so uncovering another one did not impress anyone, or rather, almost no one, because one inquisitive person nonetheless decided to study the find more carefully. His name was Christian Lascu, a curious and passionate speleologist and explorer with a richly diverse background. So Christian Lascu became interested in the find and went down into the cave. At first glance, it appeared unremarkable, as there are plenty of caves in Romania. But this particular cave turned out to be absolutely unique and soon became a huge sensation. The cave was found to contain chambers that had been completely isolated from the external environment for as long as five and a half million years. It would seem, what's so sensational about it? Sometimes it happens. However, the whole point was that life had existed and evolved independently in the cave all these millions of years, completely isolated from the external world. 
Skeptics might dismiss this, saying that some bacteria were just eking out a miserable existence. And they would be wrong, because dozens of complex organisms managed to survive and evolve in this closed natural terrarium. Many of these creatures have become almost unlike anything else. The early researchers witnessed firsthand that there were plenty of all sorts of floating and crawling animals in the cave. Some of them were quite large. But how is this possible? Let's break it down for you. Millions of years ago, there was an ancient oceanic sea at the site of the cave. A collision of massive underground formations caused the water to recede, leaving behind the cave. Over millennia, the cave's entrance began to seal off from the outside world. Various woody vegetation and loose soil encroached on the area, gradually covering the natural cavity's entrance. Groundwater eventually filled the cave's lower levels. This is how a natural terrarium was formed, a completely isolated environment that developed its own laws. Today, Movil Cave is a compact, stone-walled space with narrow, almost vertical vaults coated in a thick layer of clay and limestone deposits. The length of the explored dungeon does not exceed 300 meters, about 1,000 feet. At the bottom of the cave, there is a lake whose water is almost completely devoid of oxygen. Narrow horizontal passages divide the above water gallery into three separate caverns. The atmosphere of the underground space contains a huge amount of methane, carbon dioxide, and almost half as much oxygen as on the surface of the Earth. The air is also saturated with hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. It might seem a little strange. What can survive in such a toxic environment? Without any exaggeration, it's highly toxic. Yet, this dark cave has become a surprisingly comfortable habitat for some unique organisms. Any intelligent person might wonder what have they been eating all this time? After all, there was no connection to the outside world, and the cave was quite small. The answer lies in the incredible adaptability of life and the transformative power of evolution, ensuring the continuity of this wonderful thing called life. Anyone who has at least some background in biology can guess that all these creatures in the cave fed on each other for millions of years, establishing a sustainable food chain with some unique features. Let's think for a moment. What is the most basic way to explain the concept of a food chain? Predators sit at the very top, feeding on herbivores and sometimes smaller predators. Herbivores feed on whatever the plant world has to offer. And what do plants eat? Where do they get the building material for the trunks? branches and leaves. At first glance, it may seem that it comes from the ground. After all, why does a tree need such a complex root system? But it doesn't really work this way. Not quite. Carbon is the main building material of plants, which they take out of thin air. After all, their lush crowns with dense foliage have an actual practical purpose. They use it to ensure photosynthesis a key process in plant nutrition. And it is plants that form the foundation of the food chain. The whole chain collapses once you remove the plants, as herbivores, and by extension predators, will have nothing to eat. And what's needed for photosynthesis? That's right, sunlight. So the question is, how could complex life develop in the Movil Cave? After all, there was no sun exposure there, even an indirect one, for several million years. What formed the basis of the food chain there? Nature has taken an extremely resourceful path here. Instead of producing the necessary substances with the help of sunlight, bacteria have adapted to work with whatever resources they had as a desperate measure. In place of photosynthesis, Bacteria in Movil Cave have developed chemosynthesis as the basis of life. In this nutrition method, 
The source of energy for the synthesis of organic substances is the oxidation reactions of inorganic compounds. Bacteria have literally adapted to use available substances like sulfur and methane, which are typically toxic or waste materials in our usual ecosystems, as their nutrient medium. This is how the food chain was formed here. It was based on the same bacteria. As they multiplied, they formed nutrient-rich films, or even foams on the surfaces of underground lakes. And then, things took their predictable evolutionary course. Subsequently, it turned out that a more toxic environment, paradoxically, supported more life. Of course, some animals that found themselves in an underground trap couldn't adapt to the difficult conditions and died out. But many have evolved and adapted to the darkness and the terrible chemical cocktail in the air. This forced confinement even saved this cave community. The cave's relatively stable temperature allowed microorganisms and animals to survive even during the Ice Age. Being in total darkness for such a long time, underground creatures lost the ability to see. The eyes completely atrophied as they became redundant. The lack of heat and light also affected their external coloration. Over millions of years, almost all animals became completely colorless. Something similar can only be seen in the ocean depths, where sunlight also doesn't reach. Despite the limited color palette, the fauna of Mobile Cave is astonishingly diverse. Various species of arthropods, leeches, mollusks, rotifers, and protostomes thrive in the underground environment. These are the deepest living land multicellular organisms on Earth. These primitive creatures can detect the slightest vibrations of stone faults, air masses, and water, which helps them hunt in complete darkness. Underwater fauna is completely different from its terrestrial counterpart. For example, relict snails are a unique species of mollusks that thrive in a hydrogen sulfide atmosphere. They feed on the very same bacteria that form so-called bacterial mats, layers of nutritious organic matter. The cave is also home to water scorpions, which live in the lake and very rarely crawl to the surface. They eat crustaceans and insects. The most remarkable inhabitant of Mobile Cave is the Cryptop speleoric centipede. It is also the largest predatory animal in this ecosystem. Although its body is a little more than 5 centimeters, 2 inches long, it can be considered a real monster for such a limited space. At this scale, it's actually at the top of the food chain, the local apex predator, the ruler of the ecosystem. Extensive scientific research dispelled all doubts about the centipede's uniqueness the scientists found striking morphological and genetic differences between the cave animal and its closest terrestrial relative. Then, an international team of biologists used DNA tests and confirmed that this centipede species cannot be found anywhere else on the planet. In total, 57 species are now known to inhabit the cave, including leeches, wood lice, pseudoscorpions, the above-mentioned centipede, and much more. Of these, 37 species are endemic, meaning they are not found anywhere else on the planet. This is one of those rare occasions where people were smart enough not to disrupt anything. From the moment it became clear that the discovered cave is very unique, it started to receive special treatment. The entrance was sealed from the outside with a concrete slab, and access inside was strictly limited to researchers in sterile suits who can only go in a couple of times a year. It could be said we treat this place with the same reverence as the landing spacecraft we mentioned at the start of our story. Thus, there is hope that this island of unique, almost alien life will survive for many years to come. And now,
let's travel to the other side of the world, to the island of Madagascar. Thanks to the famous cartoon, even children, more than anybody else, became familiar with this incredible island and its inhabitants. In particular, the character named Julian, the jovial and animated ring-tailed lemur, was everyone's favorite. Indeed, in real life, this animal also looks kind of cartoonish. But this is only one type of lemur, and in nature, there are many others. Ruffed, brown, black, golden, and mongoose lemurs, each more amusing and cuter than the last. But our story takes a sad turn here, because we'll discuss a real lemur cemetery. This creepy place was discovered by paleontologists in the southwest of Madagascar, in Simanon Patsotsi National Park's Avon Cave. The cave has long been filled with water, which is partially the reason why this grim place wasn't discovered until less than 10 years ago, which is quite recently. While this might have been an intriguing, but not particularly sensational find, some details that you're about to learn will surely change the way you think about it. It's just phenomenal. That's exactly what researcher Lori Godfrey, a paleontologist from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst said about this discovery in a phone interview with the Washington Post. Her enthusiasm was shared by everyone involved in the discovery. A huge cache of fossils like this has never been explored before. Now that we know that it's there, it's opening up a new era in paleontological exploration, Godfrey said. You might wonder, why is everyone excited about this discovery? It turns out the bottom of Avon Cave is filled with the bones of not only lemurs, but also a diverse array of other animal species. Some are very rare, while others have been extinct for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Some of the remains scattered across the cave floor belong to an extinct giant bird from the Apiornis family, known as the elephant bird. This flightless giant resembled modern ostriches, but was even larger than the biggest African ostriches today. The tallest elephant bird reaches 3 meters, 9.8 feet. You can extrapolate the size of this bird from the size of its eggs. Scientists were incredibly lucky. Two intact elephant bird eggs were found in the dune deposits in southern Western Australia, one in the 1930s and another in 1992. But how did they end up in Australia? A plausible theory suggests they were carried by ocean currents. It's believed they made their way to the Australian coast via the Antarctic circumpolar current. Take a look at this picture. A chicken egg, an ostrich egg, and then this huge one, an elephant bird egg. Did you think that only dinosaurs had giant eggs? This bird could easily compete with them. At the same time, the elephant bird became extinct quite recently, around 1000 AD. That's AD, not BC. The discovery of elephant bird remains in Avon Cave certainly impressed everyone. However, the majority of the bones found were those of lemurs. Not just any lemurs, but gigantic ones that also became extinct. Looking at these cute cartoon animals, it's hard to believe that their ancestors could grow as big as a gorilla. But that's exactly how big they were. There were several species of these giant lemurs, referred to by scientists as sloth lemurs, koala lemurs, and monkey lemurs. These names were given based on how much they resembled some modern animals, both in the way they probably looked and in their lifestyle. Interestingly, the fossilization process, that is, transformation into stone in the giant lemur remains, was incomplete. This indicates that the bones are relatively young and still contain some organic matter providing scientists with additional insights and a chance to figure out what these creatures were like. Experts believe that most giant lemurs were diurnal and had larger habitats compared to modern species. 
For instance, Paleopropithecus ingens, known as the sloth lemur, fed on leaves and fruits, moved slowly along tree branches, and was generally less active. Because of this, scientists named him the sloth lemur. On the other hand, another extinct species, Hadropithecus stenognathus, was named monkey lemur because it was an omnivorous land animal that lived in open grasslands. A lot of similar remains of giant lemurs were discovered in the Avon Cave. As they studied them, researchers began to have more and more questions, and the answers to them were often as gloomy as the place itself. They all revolved around a few main mysteries. Why did the giant lemurs become extinct? Why did this particular cave become their cemetery? And what the hell happened here anyway? To get the answers, we had to look into an even more distant past. All of these giant lemur species were thriving when humans first arrived in Madagascar around 2,300 years ago. But things took a bad turn soon after that. The first thing that comes to mind is that the newcomers simply exterminated these animals. But is that the full story? Evidence from the spores of a fungus that thrives in the droppings of large animals suggests a rapid decline in Madagascar's megafaunal population, starting about 500 years after human arrival and continuing for the next few centuries. Many giant lemur bones show clear knife marks almost certainly indicating death at the hands of humans. But things are not as clear as they seem to be. Surprisingly, most giant lemur remains found in Avon Cave still suggest that the animals died of natural causes. They showed no signs of damage before or after death, no traces of weapons or predator teeth, and the bones themselves are remarkably well-preserved. The preservation is really incredible, says Brooklyn College anthropologist Alfred Rosenberger, director of one of the projects exploring the Avon Cave mystery. Rosenberger and his colleagues believe the remains they found date back to periods both before and after humans first arrived in Madagascar. Moreover, although the remains of the giant sloth were the cave's most significant find, they weren't the only ones found there. In addition to the mentioned elephant bird, the cave is full of other bones, including that of birds, turtles, crocodiles, rodents, and different predators. This raises another question. How did all these animals end up in this cave? Or rather, they kept ending up in this same cave because the remains belonged to animals from different eras. Does this really mean that for hundreds or even thousands of years, animals from totally different species, from birds to crocodiles, came to this cave to die? Unfortunately, we don't yet know the answer. The Avon Caves continue to guard their mystery about the astonishing, albeit recent past, of Earth's animal kingdom. Let's now raise the stakes in our journey. Of course, the mysteries of the distant animal past are fascinating, but the history of humans is even more intriguing. It might seem that there is plenty of information on human history. One couldn't read and review all of it in a lifetime. However, some significant events and discoveries are often overlooked in the mainstream culture. Today, we'll try to shed light on some of them for you. And it is the caves, these natural sarcophagi, that will help us in unveiling treasures preserved for thousands of years for future explorers. First, let's go to Italy, near the town of Altamura, where in 1993, speleologists discovered yet another Neanderthal remains in the Lama Lunga Cave. We say yet another because remains of these ancient relatives of Homo sapiens are not particularly scarce. However, what speleologists found in Altamura was extraordinary. For years, researchers hesitated to fully explore or attempt to remove this find, the reason being that it looked like this. The bones of a humanoid creature seemed to be embedded into the stone arches of the cave, 
adorned with what looked like pearls also firmly attached to the remains. It was clear from the shape of the skull that the creature was very ancient, and it wasn't Homo sapiens. Moreover, the skeleton was almost complete, which is quite rare for such finds. Not surprisingly, researchers were afraid to even step anywhere near such a paleontological treasure. Therefore, for the longest time, they could not identify the species of this creature. Only recently did they decide to extract material from the scapula for analysis. Paleoanthropologists were lucky. The sample contained DNA fragments that could be tested. The results were conclusive. They belonged to a Neanderthal, one of the oldest ever discovered. The remains of Altamora man date back to 130 to 170,000 years ago. Unlucky for him, the poor fellow either fell or went down into this cave himself, where he died of hunger or thirst. The discovery in Lamalunga Cave is interesting in its own right, particularly in how well the cave preserved the remains, as if waiting for the future discoverers a hundred thousand years later to explore it. However, there are other caves that reveal even more astonishing secrets about Neanderthals, and we're not just talking about the way they looked, which we already have a good understanding of, but about their way of life. What were they thinking? What kind of people were they anyway? Now, it's time to get to know them a little better. Let's go back to 1990. A young speleologist, Bruno Kowalczewski, discovers a previously unknown cave in the commune of Brunekel in the Aveyron River Valley, France. The entrance had been blocked for a long time, so it was impossible to go inside right away. But driven by youthful enthusiasm and a passion for uncovering secrets, Bruno, who was only 15 years old at the time, resolved to clear the rubble at any cost. It took him three whole years to do this. Many years later, in one of the interviews, he mentioned that his family, including his mother, father, and brother Alexis, were very supportive of his endeavor. After years of effort, a group of enthusiasts dug a narrow tunnel 30 meters, 98 feet long, and got inside. The width of the tunnel was almost like a rabbit hole. The Kowalczewski family did not have the funds to afford a more spacious entrance, but what they found inside would forever etch their name in the annals of history. First, Bruno, along with his friends and members of the local speleologists club, found themselves in a spacious gallery. It was evident right away that this cave was extraordinary. They quickly discovered someone's bones, distinct bear paw and claw marks on the walls, as well as some ancient bear dens. But that was just the beginning. After walking 336 meters, 1,102 feet along the corridor, the group found themselves in a spacious hall that had fragments of stalagmites and evidence of fires. They immediately realized that there were more intriguing finds here than just bear tracks. The pile of stalagmites was laid out in a fairly regular shape. As it turned out later, 399 intact stalagmites and their fragments were arranged in two rings, one about 6 meters, 20 feet in diameter, and another about 2 meters, 6.5 feet, standing roughly 40 centimeters, 15 inches high. Some of the debris lay horizontally, forming layers. Others stood vertically, and the remaining part was used as supports. Burnt bones were also found among them. Additionally, there were four more piles of stalagmites with a diameter of 0.55 to 2.6 meters, 1.8 to 8.5 feet, with two inside a large ring and two outside. If all of the nearly 399 pieces of stalagmites were lined up, their total length would be 112 meters, 367 feet, and the collective weight of this building material amounted to 2.2 metric tons. 
Questions immediately arose about the discovery in Brunacal Cave. What was this anyway? How old was this entire installation? Who built this? And most importantly, why? It was up to the professionals to answer these questions. The first person to enter the cave was Francois Rousseau. He was also one of the first people to conduct radiocarbon dating of a burnt bare bone. The results showed that the remains were at least 47,600 years old. However, this gave only a partial glimpse into the truth, as this age corresponds to the upper limit for the radiocarbon dating method. This test technology cannot look further into the past. This means that this bone and everything around it could be much, much older. This is why much more effort had to be made to find out the real age of the find. Unfortunately, Francois Rousseau died in 1999, which put the research on hold for a while. It wasn't until 2013 that other prominent scientists, Jacques Jobert, Sophie Verhaden, and Dominique Genty decided to continue Rousseau's work, receiving financial support from the French Ministry of Culture's regional department. Scientists undertook some painstaking work and published the results in the journal Nature in 2016. The uranium-thorium dating method revealed that the discovered artifacts were about 176,000 years old, and this became the first point in a series of sensational discoveries. It turned out that these structures were made by Neanderthals. What's more, further findings suggested that not just one, but a group of Neanderthals were involved in creating the stalagmite structures. This must have taken quite a long time, which means that the whole project certainly involved organized labor. Thus, the Brunacal Cave provided substantial evidence that Neanderthals mastered fire, used tools, had some construction skills, and were able to plan and act in an organized manner. But that wasn't the main point. Paolo Villa of the University of Colorado Boulder interprets the structures as sites for ritual social behavior. And this insight is far more profound and interesting than the previous one. There is nothing special about the fact that ancient people fought for survival and learned to make fire or negotiate almost anything. The true sensation lies in the fact that even in these harsh conditions, without advanced technology, Neanderthals had their minds on higher matters, because Brunacal cave artifacts can be viewed as the oldest evidence of early Neanderthals' non-utilitarian activities. And we can't emphasize this enough. We are talking about non-utilitarian activities. Scientists believe that stalagmite rings served a religious or ceremonial function. Of course, we know for sure that ancient people had some rudimentary sense of beauty, which is evidenced, for example, by cave paintings. But the discovery in Brunacal Cave reveals such traits existed far earlier than previously thought. And speaking of cave paintings, it seems fitting to embark on another journey to explore them further. And now we are heading to Indonesia. There too, we'll see a cave full of mysteries. But first, let me ask you a question. Has it ever surprised you that people of any race or nationality, be it Australian Aborigines or the Inuit of Northern Canada, can laugh or cry? And they do it in much the same way. After all, it's clear they didn't learn from each other. This is just some food for thought, so keep this in mind as we'll get back to it pretty soon. So now, let's travel to Sulawesi Island, Indonesia. Here in 2018, in the Leong Tedonya Cave, scientists discovered some fascinating rock paintings. They featured a fat, purple celebs warty pig next to stencils of human hands. At first glance, it might seem like another cave painting. There are plenty of them around the world, and Indonesia is no exception. However, there's a big twist here. Apparently, this is the oldest known piece of cave art, 
which dramatically predates the previously assumed timeline for the emergence of artistic expression among ancient people. At the same time, this discovery challenges the long-held belief that Europe was the earliest cradle of such artifacts. Consider this. Before this discovery, the Chauvet Cave in France, with human habitation dating back 38,000 years and rock paintings around 32,000 years old, was deemed the oldest inhabited cave. And here in Indonesia, the test revealed that the age of these paintings was at least 44,000 years. You might wonder, what's so special about that? The depiction of a pig in the cave is not the only one. A nearly complete figure of a pig is found on the cave's back wall, possibly connected to a pair of nearby palm stencils. Next to it, there are several more incomplete pig figures in varying states of preservation. If all these figures were created at the same time, it's plausible that we're looking at a piece of narrative art. The arrangement of the figures is suggestive, in our view, of a narrative composition or scene in the modern Western sense, the authors write in their study. Even if the painting remains the oldest known artwork of its kind, the authors of the study, published in Science Advances, emphasize that it's unlikely to be unique. In recent years, Sulawesi's limestone karst caves have become famous for their abundant prehistoric art. Similar images have been discovered in hundreds of caves across the region, ranging from handprint stencils to animal depictions. All this allows us to look into the long-lost world of mankind's prehistoric past and draw some startling conclusions. Griffith University archaeology professor Adam Brom, who was perhaps most involved in this research, put forth a bold theory. He suggested that the first traditions of modern cave paintings did not originate in Ice Age Europe, as long believed, but elsewhere. But this has far greater implications. Brum's discovery, as well as other examples of rock art in Indonesia, reinforces the idea that our ancestors developed the same types of abstract thinking and artistic skills independently across the globe. There is also a chance that at least some ancient artists from Europe and Asia weren't modern people. Figurative art represents a rapid leap into abstract thinking, which until now has been attributed solely to Homo sapiens. However, it appears that Neanderthals were also capable of creating complex works of art. Let's circle back to where we began our discussion about the Indonesian cave. Consider why diverse peoples, with seemingly little in common, share similar behaviors like laughing, crying, storytelling, and performing rituals. After all, if you think about it, there's no obvious reason as to why these things are universally similar. But this phenomenon is an established fact, and there's even a scientific term for it. It sounds powerful and majestic to the point of giving you goosebumps. The psychic unity of humanity. Take a moment to reflect on that. Psychic unity of mankind. This concept suggests that all humans share the same fundamental psychological, mental, and cognitive potential. So perhaps such unity is not exclusive to Homo sapiens it's possible that our ancestors shared more in common with Neanderthals than we've previously imagined. How will this knowledge help us modern people? If we all take a moment to at least think about this, perhaps there will be more unity in the world, even if just on the level of psyche. After all, we need to start somewhere. Now, let's shift our focus back from philosophical remarks to more tangible things. What else can caves tell us about humanity's past? Well, a lot of things. For example, the dietary habits of our distant ancestors. But seriously, what image springs to mind when you think about what people ate a hundred thousand years ago? Someone might think of a hairy and bearded creature in animal skin gnawing on a bone. And they would be right. Another would picture an equally primitive creature who is already collecting roots, and they would be right too. 
Today, we are going to show you a real example of what ancient people ate as far back as 170,000 years ago. Get ready to discover what the paleo diet really looked like. In 2016, a research team led by Lynn Wadley of the University of the Witwatersrand in South America discovered charcoal fragments in the local border cave, which caught scientists' attention. This ancient human site contained deep layers of fire ash. These fragments were quite ancient, dating back about 170,000 years. It took years of study before researchers found that these fragments were nothing more than the charred roots of a plant from the Hypoxus genus. Before this, seeds of root crops were also found in more ancient human sites in Israel. But evidence of the roasting of the fruits themselves was a groundbreaking discovery made by Wadley's team. The rhizomes of the Hypoxus plants can be as rich in carbohydrates as potatoes, although they taste more like a yam, explains Wadley. The abundance of rhizome fragments suggests that roasted root vegetables were a common part of ancient people's diet. This finding challenges the popular belief that early humans ate a lot of meat. Most versions of the paleo diet, which is supposedly based on ancestral eating habits, advise avoiding potatoes and grains. It seems like we've debunked some myths today. Dr. Wadley herself says, I'm afraid the paleo diet is really a misnomer. Our understanding of what early humans ate may be distorted because plant remains are much less likely to be preserved than animal bones. For the same reason, most of the time, researchers don't even start looking for them. This is how we get another survivorship bias. However, vegetables can indeed survive and reach us after millennia, even if only in the form of fossils or pieces of charcoal. This is how we get rare but valuable insights into our ancestors' diets. As for what they drank, the picture is less clear. But really, what did ancient people prefer to drink? We mean besides the obvious options of regular water and milk. Perhaps they brewed some herbal tea, much like modern humans do and enjoyed it while gazing at the stars outside their caves. Or maybe they liked to indulge in something stronger. To understand this, we need to travel closer to our own time than we previously did in the video. Once again, caves will be our guides in uncovering these ancient secrets. The earliest archaeological evidence of advanced wine fermentation techniques has been discovered in various places in Eurasia. However, ancient China is the absolute record holder in this regard. It was here that researchers found evidence of a fermented drink based on a mixture of grapes and rice, which dates back to around 7,000 BC. And then there were many more similar finds. Georgia, 6,000 BC. West Azerbaijan province in Iran, 5,000 BC. Greece, 4500 BC, Sicily, 4000 BC. Hold on, shouldn't we stop here and learn more details? Until recently, it was believed that Italian winemaking began around 1200 BC. But a few years ago, researchers discovered traces of what may be the world's oldest wine at the bottom of terracotta jugs in a Sicilian cave. This find effectively pushed back the history of Italian winemaking by several thousand years. You might wonder, what's so special about this? Well, at least the Italians got an extra reason to be proud. And by the way, this is quite a serious issue for these people. The discovery fills us with joy, said Alessio Planeta, a prominent Italian wine expert and historian. Before this, we used to think Sicily's wine culture arrived with the island's colonization by the ancient Greeks. So, you never know what surprise waits for you in the next cave, and if it would become a factor of national pride. By the way, so far, we've only talked about the wine itself, the finished product. But if you'd like to see the oldest place in the world where wine was made, we would have to go to Armenia. It is there 
that the oldest known winery in the world was discovered. As you have probably guessed, it was also in a cave. This place is located near the village of Areni. There, archaeologists discovered a wine press for extracting grape juice, vessels for fermenting and storing wine, drinking cups, as well as dried grapevines, skins, and seeds. This is the earliest and most reliable evidence of wine production. Archaeologically speaking, for the first time ever, we have a complete picture of wine production dating back 6,100 years, said Gregory Areshian, an Armenian-American archaeologist and professor at the American University of Armenia. Prehistoric winemaking equipment was first discovered in 2007 during excavations in the Areni-1 cave complex, led jointly by Areshian and another Armenian archaeologist, Boris Gasparian. In September 2010, archaeologists completed the excavation of a large vat, 60 centimeters, 2 feet deep, buried next to a shallow 1 meter, 3.5 feet long tank made of hard clay. According to Professor Oreshian, this type of design suggests that Copper Age winemakers used the most classic technique of grape crushing, that is, by stomping grapes. The juice from the crushed grapes flowed into the vat for fermentation. The finished product was then stored in jugs. The cave's cool, dry conditions made it an ideal wine cellar. By the way, this cave surprisingly brought another record-breaking relic discovery. Researchers literally didn't have to go that far to find it. Here, among sheep manure, they discovered an amazingly well-preserved shoe. Though only a single shoe was found, its condition was extraordinary. It soon became clear that these were the oldest known closed-toe leather shoes in the world. Radiocarbon method dates this unique specimen to approximately 3,500 BC, coinciding with the Copper Age era of the other artifacts found in the cave. Finding shoes from this period is incredibly rare, as leather and plant materials usually degrade very quickly. But in the case of a Rennie One cave, the contents of the pit were sealed with several layers of sheep dung. Therefore, even after people left this site, the shoe was effectively preserved for thousands of years. Even the shoe's moccasin-like design was perfectly preserved as it was stuffed with grass. Why was it stuffed is a whole different question. Perhaps the grass served as some kind of improvised insulation. Alternatively, people of the Copper Age could have used this method to ensure that shoes retained their shape during storage. This would mean that regular hay was the prototype of modern shoe trees. This was how the cave has broken another record. Previously, the oldest known closed-toe shoes were those of Utzi, the Iceman found in the Austrian Alps in 1991 and dating back about 5,300 years. The Armenian cave moccasin turned out to be several hundred years older and its state of preservation is incomparable. Here's what's left of Utsi's boot. In contrast, one could practically slip on the Areni cave moccasin and use it even today. Of course, we haven't covered every amazing find ever discovered in caves around the world. In the next episodes, we'll show you even more astonishing secrets that have been hidden in caves and dungeons for thousands of years only to catch researchers by surprise.